Good morning, everybody. We are so glad that you're here with us. Why don't you stand as we lift our voices and praise God together? You know, in Psalm 40, verse 5, it says, Many are your wondrous deeds, O Lord my God. None can compare to you. I will proclaim and declare of your deeds, though they are too numerous to count. So let's sing together those wondrous deeds of our Father. Come, let us worship our King. And come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. a child dedication service. Dedication is something that has been practiced for many years in the Christian faith and is an intentional step for parents who want to be spiritual leaders in their homes. On Saturday, January 8th, we had six sets of parents make a public decision to raise their children in a way that leads and points to Jesus. At this event, these families had the opportunity to be encouraged, challenged, and prayed over by our staff. This is only the beginning of the church partnering with these families. We as a church commit to come alongside them and create consistent relationships and relevant environments for their children 
so they can grow in their relationships with God from birth through adulthood. We know that being a spiritual leader may not always be the easiest thing to do, but it is always the greatest contribution we can make to our families. At this event, parents were encouraged to make three commitments, to pray for and with their children, to align themselves with God's word, and to connect with a community of faith. We as a church want to support, encourage, and equip these families as they seek to love and live like Jesus. Please join us in praying for these parents and all of our Forum family. Super thankful for our Forum Kids ministry. They do an amazing job, and I know we got a lot of volunteers from our Forum Kids uh, ministry team here in this service. Thank you guys for the work that you do. You are making a difference in the lives of people, and you don't necessarily always see that change and growth, but, but we kind of get that long perspective and are super thankful for that child dedication is such a, an important moment in the life of kids. So we just wanted to bring a little highlight to that. There's a lot of stuff going on in this ministry we don't often get a chance to tell the stories of. That's just, well, just one of them. Thanks for being here today. We're going to jump right into part three of a series that we've entitled uh, Redefined. And you know, this idea of redefining things and how we've redefined things and how God redefines things, that's an important idea. And, and the way that we've gotten into this teaching is a little bit different than what we typically do because we've been talking first and foremost about the, the massive amount of disruptions that are going on in our world today. Everything from pandemics to economics, academics, supply change, tons of disruptions. And what a lot of people on the, on the stage of social science and you know, cultural analysis are saying that we are seeing some of the greatest seismic shifts in the way that people think and the way they behave or the way that they live in response to these disruptions. And if you're not careful, you could stick in a news feed for just five minutes and it gets like a pretty bleak outcast. But we're actually coming at that from a different angle and saying, no, actually, this has been good for us because it has peeled back the surface. It's, it's pulled back the curtain and helped us to really dial into some of the underlying issues that are going on in our world. Some of the underlying issues that are happening like in our own homes. And we can leverage that. And so the moment we start talking about this is the moment we started stepping into really the most difficult underlying issue that you and I will face, the global issue, humanity's ultimate issue, is sin. So we start talking about disruptions and shifts and underlying issues, the moment we come face to face with one of the issues that we face every single day of our life. And you and I have redefined sin in a lot of weird ways. Like it's not that big of a deal, we don't necessarily need to talk about it, maybe it's not actually even that bad. And so we said, well, hold on a second. Well, how does, how does God define sin? And we spent the whole first message just unpacking sort of the overarching idea throughout the Old Testament about what sin is, that it's, it's deadly. It's something we got to confront, and it's not something that's good. It's actually something that's evil. And that really brought us into a discussion the next week into this idea of like, well, how does Jesus and his earliest followers talk about sin? And we saw something beautiful happen when we stepped into the page of the New Testament because paired with that idea of sin was also this language of salvation. The moment you start talking about sin is the moment you put a spotlight on God's solution to the ultimate sin problem and we use an image to sort of draw us into this idea and it was the moment that we meet Jesus is the moment we start to get a right view of our sin and a right view of the sacrifice that he made and then as we continue to understand just how our sin took him to the cross is the moment our view of Jesus continues to grow and hopefully we get to some point in our life in a faith where Jesus just dominates the landscape of everything. We sort of finished up that idea last week, and I'm just kind of bringing us in because we're going to just keep kind of layering, keep pushing into this idea. So with all of this under our belt, we're going to come back to this idea. But imagine this is an idea right here. We've been coming at it from this angle. What we're going to do today is come at it from a totally different angle and say, Jesus was the greatest disruption the world has ever known. And that disruption still continues today. He is still disrupting lives. And that's not a bad thing. That's an amazing thing. So as we talk about disruptions, we've got to get out of this idea that they're, they're detrimental to us and start looking at them as they're beneficial. And the greatest benefit is to let Jesus disrupt your life, shift the way that you think, and how you live in response to the clarity that he brought to both our sin and how to be saved from that. So let's imagine this new perspective is going to be the foundation of everything we're going to talk about today and next week. Now, I know I'm going fast. I had a team of people after last service say, bro, you got to stop talking so fast and slow down. 
I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I get excited. This is a, this is a fun teaching, and I, I get amped up, and I start talking really fast. So let's imagine Jesus now is the foundation of everything that we're going to do in this discussion about coming at this idea of disruption and how that shifts and it brings clarity to sin and salvation. So with Jesus as the foundation, all of us are responding to that in some way. All of human history has been responding to the gospel in some way or another. So let's just imagine for illustration purposes, I'm going to put up here this line with these little dots that represents every human response to Jesus there has ever been or ever will be. Now, you know we're at a 30,000-foot perspective, and we're just, we're just kind of drawing us into an idea here. We're going to get to the front door of our, our series here in just a second. So let's imagine over here on this spectrum are people who respond to Jesus, the truth claims of Jesus, by saying, I don't believe you. I don't believe who you are, who you say you are. You are not God in the flesh, walking amongst the earth. You don't bring clarity to sin because there is no sin. You don't bring clarity to salvation because we don't need salvation. So everybody from the atheist to the agnostic to the, to the orthodox Jewish believer refute the claims of Jesus. But we don't get too far removed from this and you have other major world religions say, well, Jesus wasn't God, but he was a prophet, a great prophet. This gets us into the language of Islam, one of the largest religions in the world. They have some very unique ideas about Jesus. And you get a little bit further down, and you'll have entire religious systems that are built on this idea that Jesus was more than a prophet. He was a created angel, the highest angel. When people will knock on your doors in white shirts and black ties. They're going to try to convince you of these things. And there's a lot of belief. Billions of people in this realm of thought, all ultimately just responding to what Jesus said and did. And then you get to about right here. And you have some people and some religious ideas that say, no, Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. He was God in the flesh, the pre-existent God who came down to this earth. He brought clarity to sin and salvation in a way that nobody else has done. It's only through Jesus. That, my friends, is Christianity. It's billions of Christians in the world. And there's two main streams of thought within inside of Christianity. The Catholic ideas and the more Protestant ideas. Protestant ideas didn't start to emerge until around the 1500s, but just on this whole entire other side of this sort of continuum of response, you have a lot of ideas. There's over 300 denominations in our world today. There's a lot of different ways that people have thought about responding to the truth of who Jesus is. And here's what I want to sort of build on this idea. It's like, okay, so Jesus is the foundation of everything. Well, how do you respond to that? Well, people respond in all kinds of ways from saying, no. All the way to the end of the spectrum that says he's the only way. There are some people who are so narrow in their view that if you don't do exactly what they say, attend their churches, sing their songs, you don't have a right relationship with Jesus. That's a pretty narrow perspective. That's all the way over there. But all of this ultimately is the foundation of our beliefs. And it's from our response to Jesus and our beliefs about this Jesus that filter through into ultimately what we would say is our way of life. So our lives right now are a reflection of our beliefs, which are just a response to the truth of Jesus. He stepped onto the scene. He disrupted everything. And how have people been responding to that? It comes out in the way that we live. Now, I'm building on some ideas here, so stay with me just for a second. We're like to the front door of what we're going to redefine in the last two parts of this series. Now, so let's imagine that this little half section right here, you have... Billions of people trying to think through, what's the right response? How do I live in response to the truth claims of Jesus? So in this narrow view, can you see why there is such a vast difference in opinion and in thought? Just with inside of our Columbia community, there are a lot of competing ideas that say, this is what it means to follow Jesus, or this is what a Christian looks like. And it isn't what you say it is, but you say this is what a Christian looks like, and that's not what a Christian looks like. So it's no wonder so many of us have questions, like, how do I live out my faith? What's the right way to live out my faith? What about people who don't agree with that? And what... It, how does the things that I believe translate in, into the way that I live? And we start using these terms. Like many of us today in this room would probably say, if you had to fill out a blank or fill out an online survey, you would probably say, I'm a Christian. 
you know, half of the American population claims to be Christian. But can you see that in the way of life? Or is it just a claim? I most closely associate with Christianity because, and fill in the blank. And, you know, some of us will use the term believer. Well, I'm a believer. These are sort of classic definitions. Well, uh, uh, a phrase that I picked up almost a decade ago now that's kind of stuck in my vernacular, you hear me say it all the time, is I refer to Christians or believers as followers of Jesus. And then some people, this language is kind of gaining resurgence in our world today, especially in Christian communities, that no, 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 I'm a disciple of Jesus. And that's, that's becoming all kinds of things. Okay, well, what does that mean? And how have you and I redefined what it means to be a Christian believer, follower of Jesus, or disciple? And maybe what we need to do is step right into this idea again and go, hold on a second. If Jesus was the greatest disruption and shifted the entire world, brought clarity to sin and salvation, and our response to that flows out in the way that we live, what's the right way to live? Now, I want to make one quick observation before we go a little bit further into this idea, and I, I, I'm, I'm convinced of this that the diversity in thought opens us up to compassion. Could you see why? Maybe somebody in your family or a friend or a neighbor who claims to be a Christian but has a unique way of living, how they may not understand how all this works together and they don't necessarily know what to be a Christian or to be a believer, a follower of Jesus or disciple means. And if you don't know what something means, how are you going to live it out? I think this should give all of us pause and say, well, hold on. I wonder where they are. This is a great question to ask your friends, your family members, people in your small group, your Bible study, your accountability group, and that life outside of the Sunday morning gathering. Like, what, how would you define what a follower of Jesus, Christian, believer, disciple is? Fill in the blank, whatever you want. And then ask this question, why? Why do you think that? Where did that come from? Where did that definition come from? Now, if you know me well enough, guess what we're going to do for the next two weeks in this series? Where are we going to go to find our definition of what being a follower of Jesus is? Somebody tell me, please. Thank you. Amen. Yes. If, if we don't do anything else than just reorient our life to the truth of God's word and let that shape us, then we will have done a good and noble work, my friends. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to now take everything we've talked about. I know it was a lot, but this is sort of the doorway into our text today because we're really just asking the question, what does being a follower of Jesus mean? And at the heart of that question is another question. How do, I, how do I live in response to Jesus? We could almost say those questions are interchangeable, but this is really at the heart of the issue. How, how am I supposed to live in response to Jesus? And I'm going to add on to that, according to Jesus. So we're going to go into the New Testament, specifically into the life and teaching of Jesus. And then next week, we're going to go into the life and teaching of his earliest followers. All of this inspired by God's Spirit. So we're really just hearing from God. God, what do you want us to know about what it means to be your follower, believer, a Christian, a disciple? And one of the most beautiful things we're going to see today is that in just the four historical narratives of Jesus, we refer to those as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're going to see there's really just three primary groups of people that respond to the message of Jesus. So we can take some of these big sort of robust ideas that get really practical in ways of life. It kind of brings us into that realm of compassion and helping see where other people are at. But ultimately, we're going to go, well, there's just, just three primary groups that responded to him. Well, that doesn't seem that complicated, and it's really not. So come with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at one of the dominant groups in the New Testament and how they responded to this Jesus. Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to begin. Matthew chapter 4. How are we supposed to live in response? We're redefining what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Now, let me give you a little bit of historical context here. Uh, the gospel writer Matthew, giving historical kind of about the life and ministry of Jesus, just spends a little bit of time in the birth narrative, a little bit of a genealogy, kind of walks us through some of the, the earliest moments of the life and ministry of Jesus. You know, Jesus is a full-grown adult now, and it starts with Jesus really coming onto the scene by stepping into the waters of the Jordan River to be baptized by this guy by the name of John. And we see the baptism of Jesus. He comes up out of the water. The heavens are open. God's voice audibly speaks 
This is my dearly beloved son. The spirit of God descends on him in some sort of visible form like a bird or a dove. And then Jesus is led by the spirit out into the wilderness where for 40 days he fasts and then is, is tested, is tempted by the adversary of God. Uh, thankfully, Jesus passes all those tests. And then Matthew records, from that moment on, Jesus began to preach. The ministry of Jesus begins preaching. He's preaching a message of repentance. Turn from your sins and run into the arms of God. And the reason why is because the kingdom of heaven is right here. Jesus is traveling throughout the region of the Galilee. He was teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news of the gospel about the kingdom. And he was healing every kind of disease and illness. And news about him was spreading as far as Syria. This is Matthew's way of going. Everybody heard about Jesus. Syria was way to the north. And people soon began bringing to him just people who were sick. And whatever their sickness or their disease or demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed everybody. You can imagine how word would spread. And here it is, the first group of people we see talked about over and over again in the New Testament as a responding to Jesus. They're labeled as crowds. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns of Decapolis, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, from the east side of the Jordan River, people everywhere came to see Jesus. And do you know what Matthew draws us into? These crowds did what? They followed him. And you, you may be thinking, well, my kind of use that definition of follower of Jesus. It, it, it works here when we're talking about the crowds. Now, the crowds um, almost, there's so much talk about the crowds. used almost 200 times just in the gospel narratives. A lot. There's a lot of language of the crowds and a lot of labels put on the crowds, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But I want us to see, there's really three words used in the Greek text. Uh, the New Testament was written in Greek, so we can push around on some of those Greek words and see that it was talked about as a multitude of people or just a large group of people or labeled here as a crowd. And what did the crowds do? They came to see Jesus, to hear Jesus, to be healed by Jesus, to have demons cast out. They're bringing everybody in their family just to see this miracle worker. Now, Matthew sets this whole thing up, and then he brings us right into what is known as the Sermon on the Mount potentially the greatest sermon the world has ever heard and seen. Many scholars and theologians believe it is a densely compact, compact summary of all the core teachings of Jesus in one section. So if you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, all in red letters. And then at the very end of this sermon, Jesus does something really unique, and it's going to help us sort of understand this first group of people that responded to Jesus. We're labeling that as the crowd. Watch what he says. Jesus turns to this crowd and he says, anybody who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a rock. Now that word there, who listens to my teaching and follows it. So it's not just about hearing the message. It's like it demands a response. We could also translate this word as acts or lives in response or practices. Sort of my favorite way of understanding this language in the New Testament is like a habitual daily practice. It meant a total fundamental shift in the way that we live our life. And Jesus says, when you get to that point, that's like building your house, which is your life, on the most solid foundation. This is actually a really popular teaching of Jesus, that though the rains come and the torrents and floodwaters rise and winds beat against the house, it's going to stand firm because it's built on something. And Jesus would say, that's me. Your life is built on me. But anybody who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it, the same sort of language being used. So you hear the teaching, but I'm not going to respond to it. I'm not going to act on it. Jesus just labels it. He's like, that's foolishness. That's, like, that's the equivalence of building your house on the beach, on sand. And then when the rains and the floods come, the winds beat against it, it's all going to collapse. And then when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds, they're like their own character in the New Testament. The crowds were what? They're amazed. They're like, wow, Jesus, that was awesome. And the reason why is because he taught with such authority, unlike the other people they had heard potentially their whole life. And then again, Matthew's like, listen, large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. 
So there's only three groups of people that we really see talked about over and over again as a way of responding to Jesus. We saw the first one that was the crowds. So I'm going to use an image here to sort of draw this out. This is my favorite sort of image for Jesus because it's a cross and an empty tomb. That's sort of my representation of that. So that's right at the center of everything. But then around Jesus all the time, literally all the time, up until he is literally put into a tomb, he is surrounded by crowds of people. Sometimes they're shouting, yay, Jesus. Other times they're shouting, crucify this guy. Huge crowds of people. And to hear how the gospel writers talk about the crowds is fascinating. Because on one hand, they're amazed. On the other hand, they're betraying him. Now, there's something powerful in there. We're going to skip for now and just continue on. So let's just... Let's just do a little label. Let's go, ah, oh, we walked through some, some seminal text, sort of anchor text that represent the crowd, and what have we learned about the crowd? And these are just some ideas we're going to build on today. Well, we saw the crowd, they, they heard the message. We even know the contents of the message. It was the kingdom of God, repenting from your sins and turning to him. It's this brand new way of life. And what did we also see? We also see that they were ministered to. How is that? They heard the preaching and teaching we also will see in other places the crowds. Jesus will literally multiply bread and fish and feed thousands upon thousands of people. He heals sick people. He casts out demons. He's, he's ministering to them. He's serving them. But we also see something else. We see the crowd as being invited by Jesus into a deeper, more intimate relationship labeled in the text as discipleship. So as we talk about the crowd, and we can begin to kind of come up with some of these labels, I want to push into this last one here as we sort of round out this idea of the crowd. And I want us to listen to the invitation that Jesus gives to the crowd. He does this on numerous occasions. We're just going to look at one. And to do that, we're going to go into Luke chapter 14. And in Luke chapter 14, again, we see the crowd following Jesus. And he turns around and he says something to him. Luke chapter 14, this starting in verse 25. This, this my friends, I, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say this. Like this, this text makes me anxious. And um, I struggle to step into it without giving just a little bit of a warning. I did that last service and everybody looked at me like, what, what are you about to read? And, but I'm going to say it here again. We need to be really careful when we walk through these passages because uh, I, I'm I don't want to say this as like an alarmist, but I, I'm convinced that all of hell will come out against us as we push into these teachings of Jesus, and your mind is going to begin to uh, become flooded and saturated with arguments against this teaching of Jesus. So I just want to encourage you, let's just sit and listen to this teaching. He turns to the crowd, and he says to them, here's what you got to do if you want to be my disciple. Now, we know a lot about this language of disciple from historical context, from the New Testament context, from the teaching of Jesus and his earliest followers. This language of disciple, we could just as easily translate that student or pupil. But in a modern context, some of the most relevant teaching around what it means to be a disciple in a modern context is like in our culture, we'll see that uh, an apprentice. And in most of your trades, whether it's you know, in pipe fitting or electrician or plumbing, there's an apprenticeship that often will last anywhere from two to five years where you just go and learn what it means to be something. Not just the textbook knowledge, not just taking tests. Like, I'm going to have to go learn how to actually do this work so I can go and do it for myself. So, another way, now we're in a big medical community here, so if, if any of you know anybody who's been through medical school, uh, think about what comes after medical school, and it's a residency. Anywhere from three to seven years, those in the medical community will just spend sometimes 90 to 100 hours a week training and executing the role of a physician or a medical professional. That's some of the best equivalent. So imagine when he says disciple, that meant something. That wasn't casual. It wasn't kind of come and go. It was like, no, you're like devoting your entire life. So what does Jesus say is the prerequisite for being his disciple? Now, this was such a bomb in the first century. And I'll tell you why here in just a second. He says, you must by comparison. I mean, hate everybody else in your life. Like, I would take such a dominant priority number one position in your life that second place 
is so far behind, you can't even compare them. Now, this is Jesus using that really graphic language to draw out something really important that you and I have skipped over time and time again. This is the place that our adversary wants to convince us that to be a disciple of Jesus, we don't have to love him so much that any other love compared to him doesn't even look like love. And I've heard pastors, preachers, scholars talk and explain this text away in every possible way. Well, it doesn't really mean hate by comparison. It just means just not as much love. That's just not the words that he uses. He's drawing us into something. It's super challenging. Does he have such a place of priority in your life that your marriage takes second place? That your kids take second place? Now, here's where this pushes on me in a super uncomfortable way because you know what I have a tendency to do? I make idols out of my marriage and my kids. I mean, you would think my whole life revolves around my wife and my kids. And you know what I'll do? If you're with us last week, I put on that bro badge, and I'm like, see, I'm a good husband, I'm a good dad, because I've created little shrines that I circle my entire life around. Jesus speaks right into that place and goes, I don't know if you're ready to be my disciple. And I have struggled with this teaching. I don't know if I've never not struggled with this teaching, because it's a call to such a radical way of life. And then he says, he keeps going. That if you don't carry your own cross and follow after me, you can't be my disciple. The moment he starts talking about carrying a cross is the moment he's talking about if you're not willing to give up your life for this kingdom that's breaking out on the earth, not only am I the priority, but are you willing to shed your own blood? Now this, this confronts modern Christianity in ways not many other things do because we, we live in a culture, uh, in a world of comfort and convenience. We're not willing to sacrifice our schedules, let alone our finances, let alone our priorities. We make gods of our careers. We make gods of our educations. We make those priorities. And he goes, unless you're willing to just literally give up even to the point of your own life, is it possible to be a disciple of Jesus without, without that willingness? not according to Jesus? Like, hold on a second. And if you're like me, I'm standing up here on stage right now and my brain's going, well, I mean, within reason, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of listening to those voices that are not Jesus. And then he says something else. And I don't want you to even begin. I don't want you to start until you, you take a step back and sit down and count the cost of it. And he uses a building analogy here. If you've ever done any kind of building project, the first thing we do is we go online. How am I going to have to build that? How much lumber am I going to need? How much money is that going to cost? If you've ever done like a, like a remodeling project, you've probably gotten three bids from companies just to determine if it's even possible. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here when it comes to being his follower. We've redefined Christian, disciple, follower of Jesus, believer in all kinds of ways. Most of the definitions don't actually use the language of Jesus. How many of us have ever sat down and said, do I? Am I? Is it even possible? Am I willing to put him first? Am I willing to sacrifice everything? Have I sat down and counted the cost? Now, remember this within the context of this teaching. Who's he saying this to? He's saying this to a crowd of people who are amazed. They're, they're like bought in. Jesus, I'm bringing my grandma to you because I trust and believe that you have the power to heal. I'm saying there are some people in the crowd in the first century who have greater faith than we do because they were actually living in response to a faith healer that they thought, I just got to get you in proximity, grandma, because he'll heal you. That's trust. That's canceling work. That's packing a lunch and heading out into the wilderness on probably a two, three day hike just to see this guy. That's a demonstration of something. So we define the crowd. They got ministered to, they heard the message, 
And they were invited to something deeper. And it was to discipleship. And in that language of crowd and the invitation, we actually heard Jesus say something really important. And I want to just kind of cycle back to the sort of summary ideas here as we, as we plow through this. He talked about the priority of their life. The sacrifice that they'd be willing to make. And are they being intentional? Nowhere in the scriptures do you hear Jesus or his earliest followers just talking about, well, I'm just growing in my faith, just naturally. It's just happening passively. I just show up to this place and maybe lob up a couple prayers and I'm a disciple. I mean, I think Jesus would have been like, I don't know where you got that definition from. And this is also the moment I think you and I should all just open ourselves up to the compassion of our God. As he looks at us right where we are, many of us right in that crowd, and he says, I got, I got something else for you. And it's going to require something. And I think for many of us, this, this is where the difficulty in this, this idea of redefining what it means to be a Christian, a believer, a follower of Jesus, or a disciple, if we were to just do that according to Jesus, wow, it looks different than maybe what we're used to. Now, that was just the crowd. So one of three primary groups that respond to Jesus, one was the crowd, talked about all the time. And with inside of that discussion of the crowd, we also get brought into this discussion of disciple and what that looks like. And we define that a little bit according to Jesus. He was saying this to the crowd. Now we're going to push into the second group, which is, should be super obvious to us, disciples. Now when you and I hear that language of disciples, don't we often just naturally think of Peter James, John, Matthew, right? We think of like his guys that he chose, and that's absolutely correct, but it's, it's not the total picture. Did you know that Jesus had more than 12 disciples? I want to show you this in the text, and I'm going I'm to stay in Luke, but I'm going to go back a few chapters into Luke chapter 6. Jesus, he goes up onto a mountain to, to pray, Luke chapter 6, and he prays all night to God. I don't know, for whatever reason, that's really just hit me all morning long before Jesus chooses his 12. He sacrifices an entire night worth of sleep just to pray. Have you ever done that in your life? Man, what a challenge. And then so uh, early that morning, he called together all of his disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be apostles. So within the crowd, there were people who heard the message but responded to it, heard that commitment that it took, and they're like, I'm in. And so he gets all those guys together, and he's like, I'm going to choose 12 of you. And here's their names. Luke says, they're Simon. His name would later be changed to Peter. Andrew, that's Peter's brother. Uh, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas. Another James, that got confusing. And Simon, that would have been confusing. And then two Judases. There's three sets of two? Jesus, man. No wonder they all had nicknames. Now, when he comes down the mountain, we're going to see all three groups right here. The crowd the disciples, and the twelve. But we're, f- we're just focused on the second one here really quickly, the disciples. He comes down from the mountain. The disciples stood there with Jesus in a large level area, surrounded by many of his followers. Those are the additional disciples and by the crowds. They're all followers of Jesus, but following for different reasons. Now, there were people from all over Judea. Luke's just telling us, who is in the crowd? Everybody's in the crowd. We're going to see this on numerous occasions. There's religious leaders in the crowd. There's Romans in the crowd. There's foreigners in the crowds. There's locals in the crowds. At a certain point, Jesus' family's in the crowd. And they'd come to what? They'd come to hear him. It's just this refrain, this echo. The crowds come to hear Jesus because they're amazed at his teaching and to be healed by him. People that were troubled with evil spirits, they got healed. And people were just crowding around him, just trying to touch him, Luke says, because the healing power went out from him and he healed everybody. People were just trying to get their hands on Jesus. Could you imagine dealing with something? You got a sniffle and a cold, you're like, where's Jesus? You know, like we run to Advil or whatever. They ran to Jesus. Imagine the crowds pressing in 
on him. Now, I want to show you another section. I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to see this distinction between the 12 and the larger group of disciples. Now, it's actually given a number. The Lord chose, Luke chapter 10, 72 other disciples, and he sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places that he planned to visit. Now, let's listen to the distinction that's being made between the crowds and the disciples. 72 disciples are sent out by Jesus to do something very specific. And we don't read about it until they come back. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Now, this is kind of lost on us, but in a first century culture, the ability to cast out demons was like the ultimate power. You could control demonic forces. So like if you were to kind of, and we should never do this, kind of rank miracles, that's weird to even say, but it's like multiplying food, walking on water, healing people of sickness, casting out demons. Oh, that's like, that's like the platinum level of power right there. And who gets it? Who's doing it? His disciples are. So let's just really quickly go, okay, well, we've labeled the crowd, but could we do the same thing for disciples? And we can. What did we see? Well, they don't just hear the message. We know they're responding to the message, right? That's kind of the big idea that we've been talking about. Jesus shows up on the scene and everybody's responding in some way from like non-belief to a super narrow view, but it's really just belief in what Jesus said that filters into the way of life, and it's that way of life that gets played out in actual day-to-day stuff. Well, what does that response look like? Well, they weren't being ministered to as much as the emphasis shifts to their now ministering to others. That's a huge distinction the text makes between the crowd and disciples. And did you catch this? Do you know what they got to experience as they did the work of the ministry? They get to experience joy. And as I'm looking out over the room at some of you, you know exactly what this feels like. You could tell me stories of the joy that you have experienced by just serving others. There's this weird thing that happens when you pour yourself out almost to the point of exhaustion. There's a like spiritual kind of feeling that you have that goes beyond the numbers of hours that you've missed of work or the sleepless nights that you've had. There's a kind of joy, and the moment you experience that, I'm telling you what, you're going to want more of it because you're like, oh, that's the joy that Jesus talked about. That doesn't come from me. That doesn't come from my circumstances. It actually comes in the midst of difficult circumstances. That's the kind of joy that I can have. Yep, who is that for? That's for the disciples. Okay, so we're just... just, All we're doing is just drawing a picture today, right? We've got the crowd, but inside of the crowd, there's the disciples. But in that discussion of disciples, there's also a a more inner circle that we would label as the 12. So here we have all three primary groups that respond to Jesus. The crowd, everybody was in the crowd. Non-believers and believers alike. His enemies were in the crowd. His family was in the crowd. Those who responded to the message, and then the 12 that he pointed out, you, 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 come with me. That was special. Now, I'm going to go into just a couple passages that talk about the 12. We're also going to see the crowd. We're also going to see the larger group of disciples, and it's going to show us something. So I want us to see this. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus calls his 12 disciples, very specific together, and he gives them authority. Where does the authority come from? It comes from Jesus. That's really important. And he gave them authority. I'm in Matthew chapter 10. To cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. His disciples and the 12 were given authority by Jesus. And here are the names of those 12. And Matthew, just like Luke, give us these names. And watch what Jesus does. He sends the 12 out. I'm going to send you out to minister to others. 
And then he says, don't go to the Gentiles with the Samaritans. That time hasn't come. We know that from the full canon of the scripture, but only to the people of Israel. That was very specific. And I want you to go and announce to them what? This is going to sound just like we heard Matthew talking about in chapter 4. This is what Jesus was doing. He was announcing to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. What? Cure those with leprosy. Cast out demons. Give to others as freely as you have Receive. We're getting a picture of the role and the work of those who are believers. Maybe we label that as a Christian. That term Christian is actually only used three times in the New Testament, twice in the book of Acts, none in the Gospels, and only one time mentioned by Peter later on in one of his letters. And we use that term super broadly, but is that, is that what Jesus was calling us to? Or was it disciple? Oh, now, if you say disciples, the moment you're like, oh, so the priority of your life is Jesus, and you're willing to give up everything for him, and your focus is on ministering to others. Now, that means something. If you and I start redefining what it means to be a Christian, a believer, a disciple, follow Jesus in those terms, ah, you're stepping into the definition we have according to Jesus. Now, I want to go into one other section. This is going to be in John chapter 6. This is a really... This is a really difficult section of scripture. Uh, you won't hear many sermons on John chapter 6 because it is so fraught with theological and interpretive challenges. And I'm like, we got this big juggernaut of a teaching. Let's do it. Come with me. We're going to see Jesus speak to the crowd, to his disciples, and to the 12. And we're going to see how critical these responses come. John chapter 6. We've come out of Jesus feeding thousands and thousands of people, literally multiplying food for them, feeding them. And then he and his disciples, they slip away. They go across the sea, and the crowds are like, what? Where, where did Jesus go? And so they, they go find him on the other side, and they, they find him, and they go, Rabbi, when did you get here? Like, why did you leave us? It's breakfast time, Jesus. And he says, here's the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not, not because you understood the miraculous signs. Who do you think he's talking to? He's talking to the crowds who look to Jesus to provide for them. They want to be able to consume from Jesus because he's amazing and he's a miracle worker. Jesus, what are you going to do for me? And then he challenges them. Don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking eternal life. There's that invitation again that only the Son of Man can give you. God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. I have ultimate authority. We've heard that over and over again this morning, the authority that Jesus has to give. And they're like, oh, well, Jesus, we want to be like your disciples. We want to perform God's works. What do we do? What button do we push? What lever do we need to hit? What box can we check? Watch what Jesus says to them. This is what God wants for you. Believe. Believe in the one he has sent. Now listen to this response from the crowd. Well, why don't you do another trick for us? If you want us to believe in you, Jesus, convince us. Now, not a real favorable view of the crowd here. Difficult moment. And do you think Jesus in this moment's like, all right, I will. You guys hungry? Here. Do you know what he does next? He goes into one of the most profound teachings that we'll spend our whole life just scratching the surface, talking about bread and how God provides for his people from heaven and instead of going back to the time of Moses where God provided bread from heaven and it showed up on the ground and they got to consume it it was like miraculous reminder every single day of God's provision Jesus now translates all of that and says yeah uh, that's me I I am the bread of heaven I am life and without me there there is no life there is no connection to God and guess what the crowd responded with? They began to murmur in disagreement because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They didn't give, they didn't get what, it, what they wanted. They got something that they needed. 
And it was the truth of who he is and the invitation to come and be with him. Now, do you think it was just the crowd that had a hard time with this teaching? He'll say, I am a living, breathing, walking, talking kind of bread. In the moment, this is when people's brains start to break. And anybody who eats this kind of bread, what? We're going to live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my body. It's my flesh. Now put those ideas together real quick. Unless you eat my flesh. So then, what do you think happens? What's the response to this wildly disruptive teaching that was shifting people's understanding of everything? The people, they began arguing with each other. Ha, ha. Is he going to like lop off his finger and start serving? What does that mean? I don't get it, Jesus. So he says, listen, here's the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. Now, what was his flesh? Do you remember? It was the bread. What did he say about the bread? It was God's provision that came down from heaven. That's a connection that most of us miss out on. What is Jesus saying? You need me to live. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Did Jesus start placating to the crowd? Is he worried about the numbers? Is he worried about how many people are going to follow him after this? No, he was concerned about communicating to the truth to a very fickle crowd that changed based upon what Jesus was given to him. And then Jesus is aware that his own disciples were complaining. So we go from the crowd to the large group of disciples, and then he just asks them, are you offended by the truth? Because the Spirit's what gives life. Your human effort, it doesn't do anything. I am the sustenance. I am the source of everything. And the very words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and life. I'm not kidding when I say this to you. When we hear this, we are, we are hearing the Son of God speak words of life over us. And you and I will sit here with hardened hearts and we'll argue against him. My friends, maybe like never before, oh, God, soften our hearts to this teaching so that we can hear these words that are life and spirit. And then he says to his disciples, some of you just don't believe me. That's why, that's why I'm telling you, you can't come to the Father unless, unless he draws you, unless you come through me. And at this moment, this teaching about Jesus is the exclusive way that it's through his flesh and through his blood, through ultimate intimacy with him. Guess what his disciples do? They leave him. The crowds have left, and now his closest friends and followers have left. And you know what he does? He turns to the 12 and he says, are you going to leave too? Now this moment, my friends, we don't like this moment. We like crowds. We like placating to crowds. As ministers of the gospel, we want as many people to pack into our churches as possible and we shy away from things that are going to send people running. And I don't even want to talk into that space. I just want to say sometimes the truth about who Jesus is and what he calls us into is, is hard. But it's the only truth. And our response to that truth comes out in the way that we live. And we've got a lot of confusion about what that means. And we've redefined it according to our own terms. And if you could ever redefine it in any one way, I don't know how we would condense this statement that Peter's going to give, but we'll try. Peter says, where are we going to go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe. We believe. 
And we know that you are who you say you are. Now that is intimacy. And it's the invitation that Jesus gave to a crowd of people and to a smaller group of disciples. And an invitation he gave to his closest disciples. And it's the same invitation to us. Do you hear his compassion? I think it should be the same compassion that we extend to everybody in our life who may be in the crowd, who right now may be on the fence, who for whatever reason are kind of amazed at Jesus, but are considering what it would look like to count the cost. And what is it going to do to them if you criticize, judge, pull them down because they're not in that deepest, most intimate place You and I should be extending the invitation, giving as freely to others as he has given to us. That should be a hallmark of the role of the follower of Jesus. But I want to bring all this down. I know we've gone through a lot. Let me ask you this. What do you think Jesus wants? Do you think he just wants us to be in the crowd? Or do you think he wants us to be one of his disciples? And not just any disciple that turns away when things get hard, when the truth gets unmanageable, but the kind of disciples who just say, I know you are life and I'm sticking with you. So I want to go from here and I want to really challenge all of us to think, you don't have to talk about it with the person next to you and maybe just let it sit in your heart and mind over the next couple weeks and just ask, God, where am I? Where am I really? I know I say a pretty good game, but I think I'm more in the crowd. God, I want to be a disciple, but I don't know what that looks like. That's when you run. You run right into his arms. That's when you're going to start to experience a transformation because you know who is the greatest disruptor the world has ever known? It's Jesus. Do you know what he's doing in our lives right now? He's still disrupting everything. He's disrupting the way that we think about things. He's disrupting the way that we we look at other people. He's disrupting our hearts, and he is single-handedly shifting our minds and our passions and our desires. Oh, that you and I would give in to that. So let's transition here. One last question. You know I like to leave you with questions to wrestle with. What's Jesus disrupted? And what is it in my life that needs to shift? And let's take all this stuff, right? The three crowds, the crowds, the disciples, the 12, the disruption, how all our beliefs and responses get played out in life. I know there's a lot in there, but we can just bring it into this and say, what's he been disrupting? What's he shifting in your life? Because I know this about the heart of our Father and the role of our Savior is he's still inviting people out of the crowd into deep levels of intimacy. That's going to be my prayer for us as we close out. Would you join me? Our Father and our God, by the mercy, by the blood, by the grace, by the flesh of your Son Jesus, we stand now bowing in our hearts out of reverence, out of love, out of out of honesty, of confession, out of guilt. Ah, we've been in the crowd for too long. Oh God, would you, by the power of your spirit, by the power of your word being proclaimed today, give us the boldness and the courage to come into your invitation to partake of these deep levels of intimacy and in all those places that we don't understand and we don't know what this looks like, help us to make you the priority of everything. Give us, a, give us a deeper passion and desire not only to make you the priority but a willingness to sacrifice everything for your mission, for your kingdom. We want to do it intentionally. And so we're asking for opportunities 
Uh, to hear from the teaching of your son Jesus is, is at times overwhelming. So God, would you use your word to change us, to shape us, disrupt us, unlodge those things in our heart that have kept us far from you. And may we today run, run into your loving arms, all made possible by your son Jesus. If we don't spend another minute today praising and thanking you, don't let us do anything without walking if you're thanking you for your goodness, for your grace and for your salvation offered through your son, Jesus. It is his beautiful and powerful name that we pray together today. And all of God's people said, amen. Would you stand with us again as we continue to lift our voices and worship Jesus' name above all other names? You came down from heaven's throne This earth you formed was not your home But a love like this the world had never known A crown of thorns to mock your name forgiveness fell upon your face and the love like this the world had never known and on the altar of our praise let there be no higher name than Jesus Again, you took our sin. Cause you took our sin. You are a sacrifice, you are. 
incredible things about Jesus is that he is continuously inviting us into deeper connection and intimacy with him and the Father. And we say that all throughout his ministry as he talks to the crowd, asking them and drawing them to go deeper, to find out what it means to be known by God and what it means to know God. We have a tendency in our culture today to settle for superficial and shallow relationships. I think it's because we're deeply afraid to be truly known. And it can be something as silly as, you know, not allowing the visitors in your house to go to that part of your house for fear of what they might think about you or the, the manicured, filtered pictures that we put on social media. We're so afraid to be known for who we truly are. And yet that's exactly what the Father is calling us into, deep, intimate, personal relationship with Him. And the bread and the cup that we take part of in this time of communion is that reminder for us of that invitation to draw near to the Father. So hear that invitation this morning. Draw near to him as we take communion together at this time. Let's stand again as we continue to worship, seeking to magnify the love and the glory of Jesus Christ. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, and then from north to South and the east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. And were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. And from
I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just visitor here, we would love to get to know you, have a conversation with you out in the lobby just to answer any questions you might have. And for anybody, if there's a way that we can help you get connected, whether it's to a life group or a Bible study or an opportunity to serve, we'd love to also have conversations with you out in the lobby, or you can visit forumchristian.org slash next steps. Church, we love you. We're so glad that you're here this morning and we'll see you soon.